Ben Tarnoff, welcome to the program. Hey, Gordon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you about your new book, uh, Internet for the People. I think it's like such an important uh, intervention in the kind of um, in the tech clash. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about what that is and how how your account of it kind of differs in a really interesting way. Uh, but maybe to start, I, I, I can't help but to uh, ask you about the situation in Canada, which um, <laughs> C- Canadian uh, telecom oligopolies make uh, make this the case in the United States look like uh, you know look like some hyper competitive uh, decentralized <laughs> at solar dream. You know, like sure. <laughs> it is sure. uh, it is a whole lot worse here. So what happened? Um, we're talking last week. Um, the Rogers Communication Network was down, which accounted for about 25% of the entirety of Canadian internet traffic. Um, so about 10 million people didn't have internet. Uh, some for like I was I was with a friend and and uh, and we were out till like late in the night, and she still didn't have internet. So it was the entire day. I was just talking to someone yesterday, and it was like 36 hours. Some people even longer. Um, Interact machines didn't work, 911 for a lot of people. Um, and so this has been a recurring problem. This is the second major Rogers outage. And um, thus far, all they have have come up with is a couple days of bill credits. Um, and the government is asking the telecoms to come up with some kind of deal, essentially, where in cases like this, they would sort of collectively try and solve the problem by sharing each other's networks or something like that. I mean, that's essentially the, the horizon of political possibilities. Um, how would how would an internet for the people, like how would you go about uh, facing this kind of issue? Yeah, well, Gordon, that's a great question. And, you know, it's funny as an American watching the Rogers outage from my vantage point, because I think we often have this somewhat naive view of Canada as perhaps taking a saner approach to public policy, somewhat less deregulatory. But of course, as you point out, with telecommunications, you have an intensely concentrated market, as as we do. Um, and there are kind of different histories behind those. But, you know, that introduces these massive vulnerabilities, you know, where you have these very large firms that are essentially extractive, that are drawing fees, uh, often exorbitant fees from their customers, funneling them upwards into the pockets of investors and executives and failing to invest appropriately in infrastructure, which produces the kind of uh, breakdowns that we've seen, uh, you know, obviously at an enormous scale with with the latest Rogers outage, but, you know, at smaller scales all all over the place that, that don't even make the news. You know, my perspective broadly is that if the profit motive is the principal by which connectivity is distributed, then millions of people will necessarily be either underconnected or entirely unconnected. And I think we've seen that in the United States where my work is focused quite clearly. We have, in addition to you know, frequent outages because of this highly predatory business model, we also, and I can speak more specifically here to the American context, have a severe crisis of connectivity. More than 162 million Americans, which is nearly half of the country, do not access the internet at broadband speeds. As you might expect, the un and underconnected are disproportionately rural folks, low income folks, people of color, and what they don't get access to is not a luxury. Internet access is not a luxury in 2022. It's a basic precondition for participation in economic, social, cultural, civic life. I think we've seen this with the pandemic. You know, we see the United States in the early days of the pandemic, we had people fleeing to the parking lots of churches and other community organizations that put out Wi-Fi networks because they had to apply for unemployment insurance. They had to work from home. Their kids had to take classes from home and they couldn't do so because there wasn't a decent internet connection at home. So we have a very severe social crisis in this country. And to my mind, profit maximization is to blame. 
Mm. Absolutely. So I want to ask you a little bit, and we'll, we'll get into this more, but but in the context of Rogers, the question of sort of like um, big versus small, you know, it's and it's something that comes up in your book, thinking about kind of decentralized versus larger scale uh, state interventions. You know, I grew up in, in a province called Saskatchewan, which had SaskTel, which was a, a public uh, telecommunications provider that yeah, I, I can't really remember, but I don't remember being as a as a kid to upset about it. Um, but at the same time, the sort of the the reliance on kind of one big network um, is is the problem here in the case of uh, in the case of Rogers. So how do you balance the kind of setting up a, a, a number of options, having sort of planned redundancies and, and a plethora of choices um, versus the kind of one big sort of statist approach? And where would you fall kind of on that? on that spectrum? Well, look, scale is a complicated question. And I think people have their own kind of personal preferences about whether they 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 like bigger structures or smaller structures. I think when we're talking about the internet, it's impossible to fully decentralize the internet and it's impossible to fully centralize the internet. The question is always, what do you wanna centralize and what do you wanna decentralize? You're gonna to have to have structures that exist at different scales by necessity. I think the question of what to centralize and what to decentralize has to be posed and answered at both a technical and a political level. Mm -hmm. The technology in some cases does make certain demands of us that require more centralized structures. On the other hand, there are certain scales at which different kinds of political practice become possible. And what do I mean by that? One of the things that I talk about in the book is the success of more than 900 so-called community networks in the United States, which are broadband networks that are run, for instance, by a local municipality, publicly owned, or by the users themselves, cooperatively owned. One of the things that I think is very promising about community networks is the ability for them to bring people together into space and have in-person, face-to-face, deliberative, democratic decision-making about how infrastructure is going to be deployed. So in that case, I think the local scale gives us an advantage, which is, in my experience, if you want to have a democratic decision-making process, it helps to be face-to-face -face in smaller settings. Now, that's not going to be feasible for everything. You know, we have the so-called backbones of the internet, the deeper networks of the internet, the core arteries, if you like. That may not lend itself to quite a place-based local approach. So it's gonna necessarily be a mix of different interventions, but I think we always need to be clear with ourselves, why are we scaling the structure at the scale that we've chosen? What are the political considerations? What are the technological ones? Mm. So I'd like to begin uh, the conversation of your book, sort of defining our terms, which which is a surprisingly difficult thing to do in this conversation. Like, what is the internet? Absolutely. <laughs> but but you know, you start the book talking really about you know an undersea fiber optic line, um, and, and the book really does uh, remind us of the materiality of the internet. Um, and, and reading it, you know, I was reflecting on, I can't remember when this was, but, but it was kind of in the John Stewart days. Remember when Ted Stevens said the internet is a series of tubes and, and everyone kind of, um, mocked him, uh, for that phrase and it became kind of this meme. And now I'm thinking like, oh, there are a lot of tubes in the internet, aren't there? <laughs> like, um, basic. Uh, basically, what I'm asking, to what extent was uh, was Ted Stevens right all along? Is the internet a series of tubes? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Indeed, it is. And, you know, there's a great book about how the internet works called Tubes. So, you know, Tubes is, uh, is a good metaphor. I mean, I think to your original question, it's surprisingly difficult to succinctly define what the internet is. And that was surprising to me when I started working on this book, because we talk and think so much about the internet that we take for granted that we know what it is. But when we scratch the surface a bit and try to actually give the two sentence version, the paragraph version, it's, it's much harder than we may have expected. For me, 
the internet is best understood as a language. It's a language that enables different computer networks to interconnect with one another and thus to form a global network of networks. Concretely, the language is implemented as a protocol, which in computing is simply a set of rules for how computers can communicate with one another. And this protocol is first developed in the 1970s and then greatly developed and expanded over the subsequent decades. But this language of the internet, which if you like, is a kind of digital Esperanto that allows this universality of computer communication across different networks. This language of the internet is spoken across particular structures. And those structures, as you point out, Gordon, are material. They're fiber optic cables that run under the oceans, that track continental coastlines. They are big data centers, racks of routers, all sorts of stuff, heavy stuff that you can touch with your hands through which this language is operational, if you like. So all that hardware would be lifeless without the language. It needs to be animated by this language, if you like. But conversely, without all the hardware, the language would not be able to be spoken. I think it's such a nice um, reminder that the internet isn't just like an idea that someone came up with, but took an enormous amount of investment, uh, mostly public investment, to create um, a really quite robust in, uh, infrastructure. And, and I'd love to go through some of those kind of key points. Like I think that people understand kind of in a general sense that the internet came out of state funding and, and, and state projects, but maybe they don't know the sort of particular. So if you could just kind of take us through some of the key beats, like like from the from the start with um, with DARPA and ARPANET. I mean, what what was kind of the first uh, internet? Yeah, so I think you know one starting point we could we, there are multiple points of origin here, but I think maybe the most interesting way to start the story is to talk about the launch of Sputnik mm. in the late 1950s, and the Soviets put a satellite in space. This triggers a collective freakout in the American policymaking establishment because they feel, oh God, the Soviets are outpacing us in science and technology. We need to make major investments in order to catch up. So this triggers a, a number of different uh, moves, but one of the outcomes of this is the creation of DARPA, which is the Pentagon's R&D arm. And by the early 1960s, DARPA has decided to make significant investments in computing and in computer networking. So by the end of the 1960s, they have created this cutting edge computer network called ARPANET. ARPANET uses a new technology called packet switching, which is quite revolutionary because it involves breaking a message down into a number of different discrete units called packets and then sending them off to their destination. But these packets crucially do not know the precise route to their destination. They essentially have to ask for directions at every interval along the way. So in any case, this computer network, ARPANET, connects computers, which we have to remember in the 1960s are enormous mainframes. They take up whole floors. They cost millions of dollars. These computers at different sites across the country are connected through ARPANET. Now that's very well and good if you are a DARPA contractor sitting at a mainframe in Northern Virginia and you wanna to talk to a mainframe, let's say uh, at Stanford. But what if you wanted to bring computing power out from those big fixed sites and into the field? That is, how could you make computing power available to soldiers deployed in the field? This is the dream that motivates the first internet experiments. Mm -hmm. And these occur in the mid 1970s. As we said before, the internet is a language. So the first internet protocol that is written and implemented 
is done so with precisely this scenario in mind, which is how could a soldier in a Jeep in Vietnam, for example, using a small, not particularly powerful computer in the back of their Jeep, access a program running on a much more powerful mainframe in Northern Virginia? How could computing power be brought to the service of war making? And this is why they create the internet protocol, at least this is the, the pretext for funding the initiative, which is that through this universal language of the internet, it would be possible to stitch together a global network of networks such that packets could travel from that mainframe in Northern Virginia all the way across the world to the Jeep in Vietnam. Mm. Such a, a, a typical case, right? I mean, that's the history of science and, and technology. It's always dual use uh, science and technology coming out of uh, military uh, imperatives. So, so what, I'm curious, I mean, to use the kind of tech bro term, like the use case, like what is, what is, the, uh, what is the soldier in the Jeep going to be able to even access? Like what kind of, like, what well, he's going to, like a map of, of, like what kind of information would they have wanted to convey to them? Well, so one of the uh, examples that they that they actually do uh, run, you know, one of the many experiments here is a situation in which you have a smaller computer on a tarmac. And the task is to figure out how to load a large cargo plane which is actually a pretty difficult thing to do. Because if you think about it, you need to maximize the space in the hold of a cargo plane. You need to space it out properly, um, depending on whether the cargo plane is gonna land under enemy fire, it may have to take evasive action. In other words, there's a lot of inputs to this decision of how to make the plan. And one of the experiments that they run with the early internet protocol is, okay, we're gonna put a little computer on the tarmac and that computer is going to be using the internet protocol to speak to a mainframe somewhere else. And that mainframe is going to be running a program that takes certain user input and then provides the optimal load plan for the aircraft. So that was one experiment they did to try to demonstrate the utility of the internet. Now we should say, this is the dream that produced the internet. But the internet protocol, as it is developed in the mid 1970s and beyond, is not actually used for this purpose. It's not used for the guy in the Jeep in Vietnam. What the Pentagon decides to use it for is actually something much more prosaic, which is that it has a handful of fixed line networks, you know, computer networks like ARPANET, and it needs to find a way for these networks to interconnect, to communicate with one another, because they speak, if you like, their own provincial dialects, and they there is a use for a kind of digital Esperanto to bring all of those networks together. So that's what the Pentagon uses it for, and the internet as a place, not just a protocol, but as a discrete collection of computer networks, thus comes into existence in the 1980s as the Pentagon uses this new protocol to interconnect its various networks. Mm. So, you know, one of the things you talk about in the book is just how much uh, investment um, is necessary to sort of make this possible um, mm -hmm. and contractors and, 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 I'm, you know, I'm curious, like, it, you talk about how you know it would have been sort of suicidal for a private corporation to 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 do these kinds of things. I mean, would it have been possible to have an internet that wasn't created out of just like generous state subsidy? Well, there are various cases where the Pentagon basically asked the private sector, "Could you build us something like this?" And they say, "No, we can't see the money yeah. in it." You know, when they when they were interested in packet switching. DARPA didn't want to build ARPANET itself. It asked AT&T whether they'd be interested in building a packet switch network. And the executives couldn't see the money in it. It was right. also a paradigm that was completely different than what they were used to. I mean, packet switching was uh, quite revolutionary compared to how the traditional telephone system worked. Once ARPANET was up and running, DARPA even offered it to AT&T to, to run for them, and they said no. Yes. So, so when it comes private to this- vision and, and innovation, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> Precisely. And I think this is something that's counterintuitive for a lot of folks. But the private sector, when it comes to the type of ambitious and patient research that tends to generate breakthrough innovations is risk averse, which makes sense because they are answerable to investors. They can only spend so much on research uh, without raising concerns that they're being profligate. We saw this in the case of Google. You know, Google was famous for its moonshots and eventually Wall Street managed to discipline it and say, look, you've got to rein in some of the spending if it's not going to produce uh, products that pay for itself. Mm -hmm. So the federal government and let's say particularly the Pentagon at the height of the Cold War was uniquely positioned to spend billions and billions of dollars on these very patient funding schemes in order to generate technologies that the motivation here, of course, that these technologies would someday be useful for waging war, but it was still a blue sky outfit, which is to say researchers still had a fair bit of discretion in terms of the, what projects they wanted to pursue and how they wanted to pursue it. So you're right about the internet representing a massive, a truly massive level of investment from the public sector. And I think that's something that we need to foot stomp for people because often, you know, there is a general understanding that the internet came out of the government and specifically the military. But what we're talking about is something that had to be created literally from scratch. There's a legal activist named Nathan Newman who makes this point quite effectively, where he says, look, the internet is often compared to the federal highway system. And of course, in the 1990s, the internet was called the information superhighway. So this was a metaphor that was on people's minds. Federal highway system, of course, similarly uh, being a very large public project. But Newman goes on to say, that comparison only really makes sense if you could think of a scenario in which the federal government invented the internal combustion engine, <laughs> invent, invented asphalt, staffed all of the firms necessary to produce all of these things. In other words, everything had to be made from the bottom up. Mm. And that is part of why privatization, when it begins in the 1990s, is such an astonishing move and how extreme that form of privatization is because you have a technology that has been created from scratch through billions of dollars of public investment over decades and then it's quite rapidly and quite comprehensively ceded to the private sector mm. yeah i want to ask you more about that in this early period i mean i think the word that that you used um a couple of minutes ago was was prosaic and and it, it's it strikes me that this early kind of arpanet is is fixing um a very kind of it, it's 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 there for a very utilitarian purpose um and it's doing a very particular thing and i think when a lot of people think about the early internet they think about um techno utopian ideologies they think about wired they think about these like cybernetics and this vision for a kind of radical new future, whatever their ideological orientation is. And I'm curious about if at all in this early internet, as it was being developed um, in, in the DOD, was there, was there a, a vision of how this would radically change things? Or was it really just like, how do we get this computer to talk to this computer? And that's really the problem that we're trying to solve. Or was there kind of a, a wider uh, view of what this might mean for, for society? Well, it's important to keep in mind that the, the world of people that created the internet, there were two cultures operating there. And these cultures had points of overlap and points of collision. This is, a, this is something that uh, the historian Janet Abate talks about in her work, which is that on the one hand, you have the culture of the military, which is of course, very hierarchical, very command and control. On the other hand, you have the culture of research scientists, you know, people who work for these various DARPA contractors, um, many of whom are in California, many of whom are interested in the Whole Earth Catalog and in Stuart Brand and are going to, uh, you know, different hippie events in San Francisco. So when we talk about, you know, the kind of wired era and the 1990s techno utopianism, Obviously, it's drawing on a much 
deeper current and that many of the folks who participated centrally in the creation of the internet and you know more broadly in the creation of modern computing had these links to this communitarian um, counterculture of the kind that the historian Fred Turner has written about so beautifully. So in terms of whether there were people who thought that the internet would change the world, that it had that utopian potential, that belief predated the 1990s. I think there, there were certainly um, folks who were participating in those types of, uh, let's say, proto-techno-utopian communities um, who in turn kind of provide the ideological infrastructure, if you like, for the wired era, which of course doesn't doesn't come out of nowhere. No. So so the, the National Science Foundation and the NSF net um, steps into this story at, at a certain point when um, the internet undergoes a bit of a transformation. Can you tell me a little bit about that next step? What was NSF net? So the National Science Foundation is a federal agency tasked with supporting basic research. And by the early 1990s, the internet is now under the direction of the NSF. So it's still federally managed system, but it's now civilianized. It's not directly being controlled by the Pentagon. And the National Science Foundation operates the backbone of the internet at the time, the backbone meaning the core artery of the internet, the kind of deepest and, and most centrally located network of the internet. And this is called NSFNet. And in addition to running this backbone, the National Science Foundation subsidizes regional networks that are nonprofit across the country in order to help people get connected to the internet. So by the early 1990s, the internet is widely available to US academics and researchers. And you know, if you're a uh, college student, typically you would be using the internet uh, on a college campus. So on the one hand, the internet has become much more widely available than it had been prior. But on the other hand, the demand continues to far exceed the capacity. In other words, a lot of people want to get online. And that's in part because by the early 1990s, you have the beginnings of the World Wide Web. You have the first graphical web browsers like Netscape Navigator. You have an internet that is becoming more interactive, richer, more usable. If you think about the older internet, you tended to need somewhat specialized technical skills to use it. It was a text only interface. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very fun for most people, but now the internet is becoming more appealing. So the National Science Foundation faces a crisis of sorts where it needs to find a way to expand capacity in the face of soaring demand. And, and why do they choose the route of privatization rather than, I mean, what would have the alternative been? So privatization was the plan all along in the sense that the federal government had no intention of running the internet indefinitely. The question was always timing. And because of this rising demand by people who wanted to get online, the National Science Foundation decides to move up the timetable to privatize the internet faster than it had expected to. And there are a series of moves, but the crucial date here is April, 1995. And in April 1995, the National Science Foundation terminates NSFNet, that backbone of the internet, and the private sector takes over. Now, privatization takes a particularly extreme form. As I mentioned before, despite the massive public investment required to create the internet from scratch, there is no compensation for this move. There is no enduring public or non-commercial foothold in the internet. Further, the government doesn't prescribe any rules for how the new privately owned backbones can interconnect with one another. Mm -hmm. So it's a form of privatization that essentially quite quickly ensures uh, 
a near total corporate dictatorship over the infrastructure of the internet. And I think in, in my view, lays the foundation for a series of later moves that have created the broken internet that we have today. So returning to kind of like my first question about materiality, I mean, what does that actually mean in the context of privatization? Are we, are we looking at like lines and switches and, and, and things that are essentially given away? I mean, what, what does privatization look like in a, in a kind of visceral sense? You're right that it's important here to be precise about our definitions, because privatization can sometimes mean quite literally the transfer of public assets to the private sector. So if you think about, let's say, a port, mm -hmm. government owns and operates a port, it's sold off to a private firm. In the case of the privatization of the Internet, what privatization means is something a bit different, which is the programming of the profit motive into every layer of the network. This is a network that, as we discussed, was created by the government, was run and managed and developed by research scientists. It had to be renovated from the ground up for the purposes of profit maximization. Mm. So when we think about the privatization of the internet, it's a process, not an event. There are inflection points like 1995, but it actually takes a long time and it requires interventions at a variety of different levels. What happens quite literally in April 1995 is not that the National Science Foundation hands over a bunch of routers and switchers and cables to the private sector. What happens is it terminates its own infrastructure. And crucially, because the National Science Foundation ran the backbone of the internet, because it was the agency that was subsidizing all of these regional nonprofit networks that were enabling people to get online in the first place. It had immense power to determine the terms of the transition. Mm. It was in the driver's seat when it came to what would this future internet look like? And it decides to let industry unilaterally dictate the terms of that transition. So it's a somewhat subtler move here than just saying, here is the internet as a thing, mm -hmm. because of course the internet is, is kind of too complicated for that to be the case. It's, it's more that the federal government, and in particular in this case, the National Science Foundation, abdicates its responsibility to set out a different path forward. Mm. Um, so these various sort of community networks at the NSF is subsidizing and uh, supporting um, does the, does private industry then take on the role of sort of building out the infrastructure of the internet past that date? Or like, how does it continue to expand, basically, is what I'm asking in the context of privatization? So those nonprofit regional networks, um, you know, they either go out of business or they become for profit or they're absorbed into for profit uh, mm -hmm. ISPs and telecoms. There is a big uh, building boom, of course, in the 1990s. That's when a lot of fiber optic cable is getting laid, actually too much. They overbuild, um, <laughs> partly by design, because when you dig up the ground, you try to put as much fiber in it as possible. So it's not entirely rational, but famously, there's still a lot of so-called dark, unused fiber from the big 90s uh, fiber building boom. So there is this, this big wave of investment. But of course, when we talk about the latter half of the 1990s, and we think about investment, we're mostly thinking about the dot-com boom, right? Yeah. So these are folks who are not down the stack with the pipes, with the telecoms and the ISPs, but trying to, in, in my formulation, push privatization up the stack, which is that these are firms who are trying to make money not from monetizing access, but from monetizing activity monetizing what people do once they get online. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and the platforms, and I want to ask you about that term, which, which, um, which you reject in an interesting way. But um, so this period of privatization, I mean, we should, you know, put a finer point on it and, and remind people that this is the Clinton era and the third way Democrats who are radically transforming um, the vision of government. And, and you say in the book, like the FDR style, social democracy is completely dead at this point. And so you have a kind of convergence of, you know, right-wing libertarianism with um, third-way kind of Clintonism that seems to be like, 
a, a unique maelstrom. Um, you know, the internet came sort of at the worst time, I guess, to be sort of publicly managed because of because of the political forces. Um, you know, but when, but when you write that in the book that you know social FDR style social democracy is dead, it, it got me thinking. Well, okay, like thought experiment. Like let's let's imagine that FDR style social democracy wasn't dead and the internet was maturing at this time. You know, in the mid '90s, what would have the alternate choice? What might it have been? One of the things I try to point out in my book is that there were always alternative paths that the internet could have taken. And there were always alternative proposals that people were putting forward about how the internet might evolve that turned, that would have created a different internet than the one we know today. In the, the early 90s, Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii actually puts forward a Senate bill that would have reserved up to 20% of the capacity of the telecoms reserved it for so-called public uses. So this capacity would have been provided for free to qualifying institutions that serve the public like libraries. And further, there would have been a funding stream available to those institutions to develop their own content and programming. One of the major sources of inspiration for this idea was public media. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about FDR. Of course, one of the features of the FDR era was the rise of radio. And thanks to a social movement, a portion of radio spectrum was set aside for non-commercial uses. Same with television spectrum. Now, compared to other advanced capitalist countries, the United States has a very weak public media system. But nonetheless, we do have a precedent of this idea of setting aside some portion of capacity when these new technologies become available for non-commercial uses. And that was the animating principle behind Inouye's proposal. Activists at the time called it a public lane on the information superhighway. So that was one proposal. There were a number of others. But of course, what we didn't have in the 1990s was a social movement that could have made these ideas active that could have made them feasible in the face of immense industry opposition. And as you point out, not only do you have quite strong telecom lobbying in this period, but you have a broad ideological consensus around the need for the private sector to take command. And that's reflected on the one hand, as you pointed out, by Clintonism, and on the other hand, by Newt Gingrich's Republicans in Congress. Gingrich, in particular, was a kind of poster boy of techno-libertarianism. You know, he's interviewed favorably in Wired magazine. He's kind of positioning himself in this era as a kind of cool kid of internet deregulation. So it is a perfect storm, if you like, of material and ideological conditions for privatization to take an especially extreme form. Mm. So you talk about a lot of different um platforms uh and you don't like that term i'll ask you about that but you know ebay and amazon and uber and others and um can't really get into all of them in 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 tons of detail but i wanted to ask you about why you reject the term sort of platform when when talking about these um these tech behemoths i don't love the term platform because i think it mystifies and obfuscates what these systems really are. You know, platforms suggest neutrality, openness, even handedness. It suggests that these companies are not, in fact, intimately involved in legislating our online experiences as we know that they are. So it's a term that, you know, originally has a more specific technical meaning of being a set of components that developers can build applications on top of. But platform has now become this very flexible term that essentially refers to any piece of software that's running on the internet. Hmm. And I think it does do this work of, of suggesting a kind of neutrality that in fact does not exist. So as an alternative to the term platform, I suggest thinking of them as online shopping malls as essentially the online equivalent of, of the shopping mall that we all know. And I think this helps clarify the ways in which they, they actually operate. 
if you think about a shopping mall, a mall is, is essentially a privately owned public space. It's a corporate enclosure with all sorts of different interactions transpiring inside of it. Some of these interactions are social. If you're a suburban teenager, you probably go to the shopping mall to hang out with your friends. Some of these transactions are commercial. Go to the shopping mall to buy things. The crucial thing about the online mall, however, is that everything that one does within the walls of these enclosures produces data. And this data, as we know, can be processed and monetized in a variety of different ways. I draw on the work here of the scholar Jathan Sadowski, who points out that shopping malls are, offline shopping malls are in the rental business. You know, they're charging rent to merchants for a particular spot in a shopping mall. Online malls can also charge monetary rents. If you think about the case of Uber, they're taking a fee for each ride. But crucially, they also charge data rents, which is they manufacture data about all of these different interactions that are transpiring within the enclosure. And this is the true source of their power and the true source of profit. Mm -hmm. And they, they regulate the terms of the transactions. I, one of the interesting parts about your book, you look at kind of the techno libertarian optimism of eBay, right? As, as um, trying to be kind of a perfect market, but quickly, quickly they realize that that doesn't really work. And so then it becomes a much more uh, tightly regulated space. Um, so anti-monopoly is in the news. It has been for a long time. It comes up in your book a lot. Um, it's something that with Lena Khan um, in the United States, there's a lot of uh, energy and attention on, obviously, with the EU. Um, it, it doesn't go all the way, though. I mean, tell me a little bit about what you see as kind of the promise, but also the limitations of thinking about the problems of our internet as simply a monopoly problem. Well, look, I think anti-monopoly gives us a valuable toolkit with which we can begin to constrain the power of these big firms and to shrink their footprint. So I think there's a lot to be said for anti-monopoly as an approach. I think where I part ways with the anti-monopoly folks is in our diagnosis of what the problem is. I don't think that the problem of the internet is that markets are insufficiently competitive. And I don't want markets to simply work better. In contrast, I want markets to matter less because to my mind, the problem is not excessively consolidated market. The problem is the market itself. And I'll give you an example. We've been talking about severe inequalities in broadband access in the United States. And this is often presented as a monopoly problem because we have four firms that control 76% of internet subscriptions in this, in this country. They actively collaborate to avoid competing with one another. And research has shown that if you add more entrants to a local market, rates, uh, speeds go up and rates go down. But what the data also shows is that competition tends to work best for the customers who are worth competing for, which is to say the downward pressure on pricing mostly occurs for the higher end broadband plans. And I think this points to an important point, which is that even under more competitive conditions, millions of people will remain bad customers because they're too poor to afford internet service, because they live in locations, rural areas, low income areas in which there simply isn't infrastructure and making the investments to bring these people online to get them connected is never going to pay for itself, even in a more competitive environment. We can move up the stack and talk about some of the limitations of anti-monopoly as a paradigm with the so-called platforms. One comes to mind is Facebook. If you think about a company like Facebook, as we've seen reported endlessly in the press, much of the destructive power of Facebook lies in the fact that it was optimized from the ground up to maximize user engagement. And as research has demonstrated, that means that its filtering algorithms tend to favor sensationalistic, provocative, hateful, bigoted content with all sorts of deleterious social consequences. Now, 
that imperative to maximize user engagement at all costs came out of an era of relative competition, came out of an era when Facebook was trying to grab market share as quickly as possible, to grow as fast as possible. So the idea that simply adding more competition to the markets of the internet, to having more competitors to Facebook would do anything to solve that deeper problem, I think is misleading. I think we really need to think that more clearly about the fact that the profit motive and profit maximization as the organizing principle of the internet is the core issue here. It's not how profit is pursued by larger or smaller firms. Um, and what, what would that look like? You have a lot of um, promising examples in your book of like depri deprivatizing the internet and making it more um, driven by public interests and public control. Um, yeah, what, what in your mind are sort of the more, most promising examples to, to build around? Well, what I call for in the book, as you point out, Gordon, is deprivatization. And to my mind, deprivatization means creating an internet where people and not profit rule. So the goal is to create structures that can diminish the power of the profit motive, that can shrink the space of the market instead of making markets work better, and to encode practices of democratic control so that ordinary people can participate in the decisions that most affect them. Now, when it comes to the pipes, the so-called bottom of the stack, the physical infrastructure, I think the way forward is pretty clear. It lies with these community networks that we've been talking about, these more than 900 publicly and cooperatively owned broadband networks that involve people in their operation, that encode the practices of democratic control, that diminish the power of the profit motive, and as a result are able to get people connected much more effectively and much more democratically, if you like, than their corporate counterparts. When we move up the stack to the application layer of the internet, where the sites and the apps live, where we experience the internet, the strategies for deprivatization become more diverse and more complex. And that's, I think, by necessity. Because if you think about a company like Facebook, Facebook is much more complex, complicated in its computational systems than a company like Comcast. And further, Facebook is a lot more different to a company like Uber than Comcast is to AT&T. So there is a complexity and diversity at this layer of the internet that we have to acknowledge. And I think accordingly, our deprivatization strategies have to be comparably complex and diverse. So in the book, I point to a number of promising experiments that give us some possible ways forward for how we might think about deprivatizing these different realms of the application layer. I talk, for instance, about Mastodon, an open source project in decentralized social media where people can launch their own social media servers and then interconnect them using open protocols, which is the same principle that the internet itself runs on, to form federations. And people are using Mastodon in particular to experiment with things like cooperatively owned social media sites where content moderation decisions are made democratically by the users themselves. We could also point to worker-owned app-based services, you know, worker-owned ride-hailing apps that are competitors to uh, corporate counterparts like Uber. So there are a number of places where people are developing some interesting experiments that I think point the way forward to a different kind of internet. That's really exciting. That's one of the parts that I think the anti-monopoly vision kind of misses because you know we could talk about price and we could talk about access and we talk about reliability um till the cows come home and that's really important but democratic will democratic control of over sort of authoring our tech future and our and, and our tech present is something that demands another approach and and you just talked a little bit about that with mastodon but i'm i'm just curious to ask you a little bit more about that i mean what what is the kind of uh radical democratic vision for what an internet 
a publicly democratically managed internet could look like? I mean, give us a sort of pitch about why, why even that matters to us. Well, it's been easier these days to make the case to people why it matters, you know, because I think on the, on the one hand, people are often just fed up with how frankly spammy and unusable a lot of the yeah. current services are. I mean, I feel that way every time I look at Facebook, it's just a nightmare. But also I think people have become much more aware of the social consequences of some of these products and services. You know, Facebook in particular, I think there's a much wider awareness of what are the consequences of the power of a company like Facebook? How does it help spread right wing propaganda? How does it, you know, have these quite destructive effects on our civic and political life? So that has to be part of the conversation. It's not simply a consumerist appeal that says, well, I think you might enjoy this product a bit better. It's also a political one that says, hey, there are actually costs associated with these different services, and we need to think about these things holistically. Now, there are limitations here. I don't, I'm not suggesting that we move everyone from Twitter and Facebook to Mastodon and call it a day. Mastodon is very much an experiment. It is limited. It has serious resource constraints. It doesn't have billions of dollars at its disposal in order to develop. And further, it is, if you like, imprisoned by an enemy paradigm. You know, it is copied off of these corporate services. And to my mind, if we really want to create an internet for the people, we have to go further. It's a good first step to say, what would a cooperatively owned Twitter look like? What would a cooperatively owned Uber look like? But at the end of the day, these are enemy architectures mm -hmm. that encode certain imperatives into their technical structures. And if we want to create a genuinely qualitatively different way of being online, we have to create new architectures. So one of the things I talk about in the book is the need to use public policy to develop spaces in which ordinary people can come in, get connected with the technical expertise that they need to build entirely new online services that serve their everyday needs. This collective embodied financed process of experimentation is ultimately what I believe will give us the, an internet for the people. That's very exciting. It, it, it's, it's hard to imagine because I don't think there's been enough radical imagination like in a way where what are we even looking to we're looking back to you know there was a a utopian vision in the early days but we're, we're looking forward and and um like you said we're trapped but we're too trapped in the existing paradigm to even imagine what a radically different internet could look like and that's that's super exciting to do one of the challenges, I guess, in doing that, and, and you know, this probably has more to do with um, right wing propaganda than anything, but you know, it's worth it's worth sort of grappling with, is that there's a perception, at least, that government is particularly inept, uneducated, and ham fisted when it when it comes to technological innovation and policy and whatnot. And, and, and there's some resonance to this. I mean, you think about in the, in the context of, of Canada, I mean, we had a, a COVID app that was basically in a, a complete boondoggle, an arrive can app that no, nobody likes um, in the United States. Of course, what happened when um, the Obama administration put up those healthcare exchanges and they, they immediately crashed. Um, and of course, you know, what I, began with in terms of the internet as a series of tubes. Um, how do we address the skepticism to the extent that it's warranted, and I don't know how, how warranted it is, of having uh, policymakers sort of be involved at the kind of bleeding edge of techn technological innovation? How, how do we overcome that public perception that, that they're only going to screw it up? Well, part of this is a problem of public sector capacity and technology. And you, you mentioned the healthcare.gov debacle. Out of that came some initiatives to try to address that capacity problem. So we now have 18F, which is a you know software shop that within the federal government that is an attempt to build up the 
software engineering capacity of the government so that those types of debacles don't happen again. But this is, you know, more broadly a problem. I mean, this is not limited to software development. This is a problem, a much, a much more difficult problem, which is that all sorts of capacities that the public sector formerly had, it has outsourced to the private sector, that it increasingly can't do things itself. It is often, in fact, legally required not to do things itself, which is particularly crazy, but to farm things out to the private sector. And in private sector, as we know, through these, these partnerships and contracts, there's an immense amount of, of corruption and incompetence. So broadly, that is a capacity problem. And I think, you know, as, as the geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore would put it, it's not an absolute loss of capacity. It's that the capacity has frankly been reallocated. I mean, the, the U.S. state is as powerful as ever, mm. but what it prefers to spend its money and time on is caging and killing people, not providing social services, not building infrastructure, and so on. So how we reallocate capacity to things that heal, things that uplift, things that empower people is ultimately a matter for social movements, you know, and I think the internet is is a piece of that, but this is a much broader political problem. I would say in the case of the public sector, a demonstration effect is a very powerful thing. And part of why the telecoms have been so bitterly opposed to these community networks that we've been discussing is because they fear the power of a good example, mm -hmm. even if it's a small network that serves a small community, if, if the word got out that you could have a publicly owned broadband network that provides better service at a lower cost than Comcast and actually enables you and other community members to participate in decisions about how the network is going to be run, that's terrifying for the telecoms. So that's part of what we have to do. And that is working at the level of imagination. You know, one of the successes of the neoliberal project has been to come into government to slash and undermine certain services and then point to them when they fail and say government can't possibly do those things anyway, right? They've produced their own examples to substantiate their own ideology. And we have to do the same on our end. Hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh... You're, you're talking to a Torontonian, right? And, and Toronto is a great example, headquarters of, of Rogers Communication, where we started this conversation. And, um, and recently, there's been some chatter in, in city council about having a municipal internet network, perhaps just for um, municipal buildings, but perhaps broader than that. And what, what do you know? Um, the telecoms, Rogers in particular, um, just so happens that someone who's on their board is also our mayor. Um, <laughs> it looks like that that uh, plan is not going to come through or it's being obfuscated and, and obstructed. Um, so even though I think like connecting a bunch of libraries and, and pools and stuff is not a threat to the bottom line of Rogers, it is to, to your point, the kind of example, like what if it works, you know, what if a bunch of people start using it and suddenly, suddenly you have a case. Um, so, so right. but and, and, and what if, you know, not just what if it works, but what if we could provide an example of a public sector that actually was driven and by people, you know, I think as part of what we're talking about is like, not just what is the state for, but what should a state look like? And this kind of very technocratic, bureaucratic, top-down style of state is one that the capital, frankly, prefers. It's much easier to do business with. So the idea of a state that is actually not just giving real services to people, but actively involving them, giving them more power to determine the conditions of their everyday lives, that's, I think, particularly terrifying. Mm, absolutely. Um... Ben, I, I wanted to, to end uh, going back a little bit in terms of that kind of radical vision of what the internet could be if we broke out of the paradigm that we've been given by our ideological enemies, essentially. Um, you know, I think you're careful in the book to not say this is my manifesto or program or my prescribed set of uh, policy recommendations to create the Ben Tarnoff internet. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to make you do that. 
Um, but I, but I am kind of curious if you could give me a sense of what kind of ideals and what, what kind of tangible, uh, examples or experiments do you think, uh, that, that we should undertake? I mean, what would your kind of radically democratic, uh, internet for the people, what might it look like? Well, I did a adapted excerpt from the book in, uh, the New York times. And this is one thing the editors pushed me on was like, okay. I want to see it concretely. What does this look like? <laughs> and, you know, as you point out, I have some reluctance about being excessively programmatic because on the one hand, I think you need to give people some examples to make it concrete, but I don't want to put myself in the position of dictating the precise blueprint. Inevitably, the blueprint itself will have to change because part of my argument is that we need a process of experimentation to develop new ideas. Absolutely. That said, in the piece, I have a kind of science fiction-y <laughs> scenario in which you wake up one morning, you grab a cup of coffee, that hasn't changed, fortunately, and you log on to a social media site that is run by your local library, in which librarians are present to help contextualize and classify and curate information. They essentially help uh, play the role of maintaining the health of the information environment, if you like, and librarians are uniquely well positioned in order to do that because they have those those skills, which of course long predate the internet. And on this local social media site, you're engaged in conversations about say an upcoming municipal election, about things that are going on in your community. But critically, because this site is federated through open protocols with sites throughout the country and throughout the world, you're also able to exchange messages with people elsewhere. Now, content moderation decisions in this scenario are made at the local level. They're made with members of your other local community in in-person settings. You all get together at the local library and decide how is information going to travel in our site, but it's not an isolated site. You are still able to connect to this wider group. So the internet remains global, but its governance in this respect is local and thus the possibility of in-person deliberation. I think in this scenario, I extend the thought experiment a bit more, which is you then use a uh, worker-owned app-based service as an alternative to something like Uber in order to grab a, a ride hail uh, uh, car to get to work. So admittedly, this is not the most imaginative possible <laughs> scenario. These are this is an attempt to think through a near future based on stuff that more or less exists in the present. So there are some limitations here. But I think these experiments, you know, all these things exist, as we've been discussing. These experiments do help us denaturalize the Internet as it exists. And that might be their most important effect to teach people there's nothing inevitable about the Internet that we have. It's possible to imagine and not just imagine, but actually to implement some pretty interesting alternatives. But if we want to go further, we need public investment and we need a social movement that's capable of demanding public investment. These things can continue to operate at the fringes, but if we want to bring them into the mainstream, if we want to make them more robust, more imaginative, and crucially more of a threat to the big firms, we need public investment. Um. Well, Ben Tarnoff, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been such a delight to uh, chat with you about your, uh, your excellent book, which I definitely recommend people check out. Thanks so much for having me.